Hello everybody and welcome to LMM and as you can probably tell from the fact that I'm stood in the middle of a railway it's now time for another episode of Lorry Goes Loco. If you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment then the links to our social media is coming up on the screen now including our discord where you can talk to me and the rest of the team and other like-minded people about trains, planes, tractors and of course railways and locomotives. And if you want to help support the channel and help it grow there's also a link there to our Patreon which uh, if you consider helping us out that's awesome. Today I'm here at the Middleton Railway in Leeds and I'm going to need this. As many of our railway enthusiast friends will be aware, back in the Industrial Revolution, Leeds was a powerhouse and housed several of the major companies that made industrial locomotives, such as Hunslet, Hunswell Clark, Kitson, Manning Warder, and John Fowler. And in fact, several of the companies actually tested their locomotives here or had their demonstrators run here at Middleton. Now, the collection here has been made to help preserve the heritage of the area with lots of locomotives that came from Leeds. And so in the engine shed in the display, they're all Leeds based locomotives or Leeds created locomotives. With the exception of the one Danish locomotive that's here for various reasons. And there's the Peckett. Oh, and there's 1310 as well. And actually come to think of it, quite a few of the diesels have nothing to do with Leeds at all. The site here is that of the oldest continually operating railway, getting its Act of Parliament to run in 1758 and being the first railway to commercially operate steam locomotives which started in 1812 which for those of you who are not aware that's a very long time ago and they continuously work trains from the pits up there bringing coal that way this way to the centre of Leeds for well quite some time it's basically how the railway survived so you may be wondering, well, how did this become a continuous operation? Because obviously the coal traffic has dried up. This is one of those stories that you don't really quite believe. You get told, but you can't quite believe it happened. In 1959, the late, late 50s, a group of university students got together and managed to do something amazing. Now, as the 60s dawned, the line was no longer being used for coal. That had been diverted and now connected to the old Great Northern Line, meaning this line wasn't really being used. They managed to get their hands on a loco from Hunslet and hauled with it an ex Swansea and Mumbles Railway tram for a week, starting on the 20th of June 1960. Which means that the railway is actually currently, as time of filming, celebrating its 60 year anniversary, and that makes it the first standard gauge preserved railway in the world. Now, lots of you will think, hey, but that's the Bluebell Railway. Nope, these guys beat them by two months, which is kind of special. But this isn't the most amazing part of the story, oh no. Using their hired locomotive, the group managed to organize to be able to run freight trains along the line. I just want to reiterate that. A group of students, not railway people, but students. They started this in that September of 1960 for Robinson and Birdsell scrap merchants. And amazingly, they kept operating this all the way up to 1983. With the passenger services starting in a form similar to what they do today in 1969. And that's basically how it's been ever since. They've continuously operated this railway, well, somebody has, since 1758, which is bonkers, absolutely bonkers. So with the basic history looked at and the kind of overview of what the society is here, we're going to go and have a look at today's mighty giant locomotive. Well, diminutive. That's the first word that comes to mind to describe this. And one of the big things about this, and possibly the only big thing about it, is in all of my travels, including Lorry Ghost Loco and just visiting railways for fun, it's one of the very few locomotives I've come across that genuinely goes by two names. There's lots of engines that have had a name and they've been renamed, and so they've got previous names and current names, but this goes by two names equally. It's either called Courage, after where it worked, or the more appropriate name of Sweet Pea, because it is both tiny and not green. And I do like Sweet Pea. And it does solve the mystery of why I'm carrying this around with me, because it has no horn. So I'm just going to 
put that there so I don't need to carry on. Isn't it absolutely amazing? This incredible piece of kit weighs less than six and a half tons. It is smaller and lighter than my own Rustin 48, which I take to be the basic benchmark of small standard gauge locomotives. In fact, to my knowledge, this is the smallest standard gauge locomotive ever. It's, it's utterly ridiculous, isn't it? It is just mad. I mean, everything about it is the wrong proportions. From what we understand, it's basically a narrow gauge bonnet and engine in here, bunged onto standard gauge frame. And it's not even that, I mean, the framework here and the way the wheels, this is basically a wagon's frame. This isn't a locomotive, this is a wagon that's built like this. And then it's just got this little engine box put onto it, bonnet, in the middle, which doesn't really make any sense because it's the proportions are just totally weird. And then you have this, which is the most bonkers thing. This isn't missing a cab. This isn't part way through an overhaul or something. This is how it left the factory with like a safety frame and a sunscreen. It's basically all it is, is to keep the sun off and to stop you falling out of it. It's just, it's absolutely bonkers, but also so incredibly cute. I mean, there's very little else I've ever come across on the standard gauge, which looks quite as amazingly cute as this. And of course, one of the things you may be noticing across the front here is you go, oh, there's an attachment here. Does it have vacuum? No, of course it doesn't have vacuum. That's where the starting handle goes. It hasn't got anything else. It's genuinely a locomotive. You could only start on a starting handle, which is, it's, everything about it is mad. It's, it's lighter than mine. It's short, it's 10 foot long. It's shorter than mine. The wheels are just over, they're two foot three. It's absolutely minuscule in every single way. It's like the engine's got two cylinders. It's just, this is somebody had a really stupid idea. Like, this is kind of the design that comes after you've been at the pub with your mates. You've had one too many of, I've got a great idea. You know those narrow gauge engines we built, yeah? What if we put it on the standard gauge? Yeah, that'd be amazing. Why would we want to do that? We have no idea. This is a design that they called the estate range locomotive. Presumably it was designed to work on light railways and small companies that needed a small lightweight locomotive to run across not so good track, moving, you know, a wagon that would come in off the main line on a Wednesday and the following Friday you'd need to move it back again. Something simple like that. And as you can probably tell by looking at this thing, the design was a roaring success. They built two and this is the only one that survives. In fact, one book on Hunslet describes this thing as being a freak. She is Hunslet number 1786 of 1935, and she was built to go to F. Courage Brewery at Alton, which is where the Mutants Railway now runs to and from. And she had an exceptionally busy and hard life. Upon delivery, it worked for quite literally just a couple of years before the rail traffic out of the brewery ended. And then you may think, oh, well, an engine like this is clearly very useful and, you know, a small size could go anywhere, be transported easily and cleverly and, yeah, go anywhere. Nope, no, nope, it sat at the brewery for 30 years, parked up and just forgotten about. It just nothing, it did nothing. And then, the interesting thing is after all this time of it sat around the company had kind of got attached to it they'd kind of fallen in love with the little odd looking thing that was parked up forgotten about and so they decided that they would sell it they didn't want it to go to scrap they wanted it to go into preservation so they put an advert out in the railway magazine in 1967 saying it's for sale and the railway here bought it and it was delivered via rail on a lomac which is just <laughs> Fantastic. It came in fire rail because it's that small you can put it on a rail there. It's very strange. Which means it has now worked more here in the hands of the Middleton Railway than it ever did in its original incarnation. This is another locomotive that's actually found its main life in preservation, not in its original incarnation. Which is really quite beautiful. I mean, it, it is frankly useless, but no, it, it's done more here than it has anywhere else. And I, I appreciate, you've got to understand, for me to call a locomotive useless, it's... There is a specific application for this machine of which nobody knows what it is. It's, it's absolutely glorious.
When the locomotive turned up here, because it had been stored undercover, it was used heavily by the railway in the 70s working the freight services. It's the perfect size thing to move around a wagon or two at a time. It was absolutely perfect for the operation here at the Middleton Railway. And it's one of the quite rare survivors in preservation history that it actually hasn't had to have anything major done to it. The most the railway has done to it in the years between it turning up here and now is it's had a couple of coats of paint and it has been serviced and had some new filters and such. But it's never actually required a major rebuild or any major work. This is more or less as it was when it left the factory, which is just quite superb. And also, it's not really done that much in preservation. Since it's been here, all that it's actually done is it's left the railway twice. It went back to Alton to celebrate 100 years of breweries in Alton, where there's a lovely photo of some of it sat next door to a 9F, which is obviously one of the biggest engines we had in the UK. And this thing, it's just, it looks very silly. And it also went to Railfest in, I think, 2012, where I went and saw it and fell in love with it at the time. So when it was offered to me, I was like, I've seen that, I know what it is, and I really want to drive it. So it's, it's not done that much, and it is a wonderful thing to have here at the Middleton Railway, just such a wonderfully quirky piece of history. Uh, it's got wonderful things. Like I'm sat here, the buffer beam comes up here, and it's only a piece of, like, inch-thick plate, but it, it stops about there. It's, this bit here is all just for show, to take the spring, which is cut out of the running board, to take the place of the spring for the front draw hook. It's just, it's full of wonderfully quick... I mean, the running board doesn't even continue behind me. There's, there's nothing there, there's just gaps you can see wheel, which is actually, that's something quite strange to come across. It's, it's all just beautifully, beautifully twee. I really, really like it. It's just... There's, I've never seen a, a locomotive on the standard gauge which is just this cute. This is just beautifully cute. And that basically is all the history about it and what it does. So let's go and have a look in the... I can't really call it a cab. So we're going to go back to my favourite term of the flight deck and have a look at the controls. Of all the locomotives I've been in the cab of, this is by far the strangest. The thing I like most about it is the fact it's just got this safety net rail thing to stop you from falling out of it. But absolutely nothing in the way of the door. But it is this convenient size that I'm too broad to fall out. That's the safety mechanism here that I can't fall out unless I twist to go out. So I think we'll start off with the advanced gauges and controls this has which is right here, where we have an oil pressure gauge. And that concludes all of the gauges and all of the information on anything we've got in here. That's it. There's nothing else, which is glorious. So coming across here, the first control up here, this is the front sanders, which obviously operate the sanders. And then here we have the throttle, which moves a, a linkage in there. It's with me so far. This is our reverser, pushing it that way will engage forward and bring it back there will engage the reverse. Still pretty good. And then we have here, which is our gearbox. At the moment we're in neutral by rocking it forward. And this is quite stiff. We can drop it in there and then gently drop it into gear like so. And that is a lot of force needed to, to do that. And then dropping it in gently, that's your clutch control. So you can gently feather it in so everything doesn't shoot off like a scolded cat. Straight in front of me, in the middle of the entire cab, very confusingly, we have the handbrake. Now this is a quite a, an interesting handbrake in that it's that there's basically a turn in between it being on or off. It is a rapid turn on and bring the thing to a halt. Coming to the back of the cab, we see my single favorite thing, which is the bell. If you don't have the horn to hand, you have a bell. We have rear sanders fitted here, and then the addition here of a vacuum gauge and a tap in order to break vacuum. By opening that up, we can destroy vacuum. We have no way to create a vacuum, but it does mean that we can safely and legally operate a passenger train to be able to destroy the continuous brake. Yeah, that, that actually does bring us to the end of the cab. There is nothing else to talk about in here. Apart from that, it's, it's quite nice and big. There's Everything is in the way. There's a fair amount of square footage up here, and so, but to actually move about, handbrake is right in the way. The gears are right in the way. It's all just a little awkward in the way. I mean, it's very much designed to be single man operated. Everything is duplicated across it, which is really quite good. And of course, visibility is absolutely superb. There is nothing in my way that way, nor is there anything behind me. You can, you can see everywhere here. There's no body panels in the way to block anything. And what I really do like from a driving perspective is I can see down there to see the wheel. 
which means I can see quite easily if I've started to lose traction or anything. It's quite good in that regard. So with these complex and very advanced cab looked at, I suppose the next thing to do is to go and have a look at how we prep this and then get it ready to go. But before we actually prep this, I suppose we should take the cover off here and have a look at the just incredibly powerful unit inside here, which is, of course, oh, utterly tiny like everything else. This here is a Lister two-cylinder diesel engine, which produces, wait for it, it's pretty good, 22 horsepower. It produces less power than my own Ruston 48. It's, my Ruston is meant to be twice as powerful as this, which is just fantastic. It does have this rather beefy flywheel on it, which is probably where any of the power actually comes from, is converting that into some kind of forward momentum. We have some interesting other features on here. So we have high compression and low compression on this, so you can swap it over for attempting to start it on a cold day. And then my personal favourite thing is this. This bin can here, this catches the diesel that trips out of the, the bleed off returns. And so you just have to remember to repeatedly drain the pot, otherwise it will overflow and you'll just get diesel vapour and smoke coming off as the diesel slowly burns off. Which is just, it's just a, such a wonderful bit of engineering. It's like, the waste diesel we're not using. Shall we have it loop back into the fuel tank? Nah, nah, we'll just drip it down the side of the engine. So yes, we have this wonderful bean can to catch it and then we can put it back in the tank, which is just fantastic. We have a uh, very little else in here that's worth anything. There is a single pipe here that comes off the radiator to the block and then goes back again and nothing else. It's, it, it goes there and it goes up there. That's just fantastic. We also have the air intake put right next door to the engine because as we know, engines love having pre-warmed air. It's just what makes everything more efficient is when you're going along, you're getting lots of nice hot air. It makes it uh, explode better because it's already hot. Yeah, totally works. It's just, it's fantastic. And of course, then we've got a, a tap here so we can drain it should we want to leave it. And the first thing that I kind of looked at was why is there a chain here? And it looks very strange. Well, the, the chain there, that goes to where the hand start lever goes into. And that's the mechanism for hand starting it, which is just absolutely superbly brilliant. It's, a, it's one of the few locusts as well that the, the engine actually takes up the majority of the engine bay. It's a decent size. So with that, let's go around the other side and let's start checking things and get it ready to go. So preparation, well, this is a long and arduous task. First things first, we need to take this engine panel off like so. And we can drop that down out of the way. Revealing this side of the engine. Now there's a couple of things that we need to check in here. Firstly, the throttle linkage worker. To turn it off, by the way, you hold it like that. that is, that's how we shut it down. That, that is it. There's a couple of other things that are worth noting here is these are the decompressors. You push that in and that's the decompressor now in, then you pop it back out to start it. So starting this thing will involve a couple of us and me having to crank it over and one of the nice guys here at the railway helping out on the decompressors. So at first stage is we pull out dipstick here and check to see if we have some liquid dinosaur on it. And the answer is yes, plenty of liquid dinosaur. Obviously if it's low, the filler cap is there. I've got my little feeder here and there's just a little divot in here. Just chuck a little bit of oil in. Now what I've done there is I've overfilled it and that's going to help protect the whole area from rust in the future because obviously I'm not incompetent. And while we're here as well, we'll just have a look, make sure the belt on here is not going to break and that's just driving the fan. That's nothing crucial on that and that just spins the cooling fan. Apart from that, everything looks in order so we'll go around to the other side. And then of course, underneath we have the chains here which don't actually have an oiler of their own so it's just a give it, reach in and chuck some oil on them and uh, hope that this is going to lubricate the things well enough just like so and then obviously I need to go and do the rear one as well but uh, that's what it is like so over here again it's just a quick inspection of everything and it's all there and a bit of oil goes in the divot over here he says waiting for the oil to rush out of this feeder there we go a bit of oil in there a better job that time a little drip of oil just on that in there and on this point here. The side here, 
there's a greaser and we just need to twist that one turn in just to force some grease inside there. And I think that concludes the oil up here. Next, we drop down to here. And this is awkward because you have to stop in just the right place. There's a little, little pot here and that's what we use on the axle boxes. So this is just chuck a load of oil into here. Now technically I should pull the trimmings out and give it a, a clean out and make sure the oil is flowing through but I am reliably informed by the railway that they are top notch at the moment. So chuck a load of oil into that. Lovely. Snap it shut and then again another one here. Again you can imagine that if I've stopped in a different position this can actually be a pain in the backside to try and oil up if you've got to shunt the thing around but uh, here we are. And come on feel yourself up. Now, once I've done this side, I do need to go do the other side, but for the purpose of the video, we're just going to leave it alone. But uh, it is a repeat the other side job. From here is now, well, about half onto the cab. We've got another divot here. This is very much similar to a steam locomotive in its application of divots. It very much feels like it's come from the age of steam. We have another divot on the back here, which is fairly there we go lovely and then a little bit oil just drops in here to keep the transmission here moving nice and smoothly and then it's just repeat oh there's another one here on the throttle like so and then it is very much a repeat on the other side so and then after that we need to have a look up here with everything now oiled up, next stage is to check the fuel, which is done by removing this plug and going, I can see diesel. I love these complex locomotives. Next, we need to go, and finally, we need to go check the water, which involves climbing around the jungle frame designed locomotive. It's basically a kid's play place. Trying not to do anything with the exhaust, which comes up and over the top of the locomotive, and then go, oh God, I can't see. Yes, there is indeed water in there. Okay, I can put that back, I am an adult. And that actually does genuinely conclude everything we need to do. So in order to start it, I need to go find myself a strapping young man from the railway who's going to help me by uh, pressing various things, the decompressors in there, while I do your favorite thing of trying to spin the handle and hoping for the best. My old friend, the starting handle. Now, what you don't know is behind you, there's a, a group of the, the members of the railway who have gathered to watch this spectacle of me attempting to start this thing. So we slide that all the way in like so and feel it engage. Then just for added complication to make sure that uh, it all goes really, really well, you have to push this thing in. And then I've got my friend Chris here to push the decompressors in at the same time. And hopefully when I get it spinning over enough, he'll then pull them out and it will go puff, puff, puff into life so goes the theory so like that oh my dear jesus why is this like oh. right here we go god jesus like decompression is that the decompressor's out wow is that locked in now oh Jesus! This is without doubt the hardest thing I've ever tried to... <laughs> oh! We're taking a break at that. What's the matter, Laurie? Do you want to go with this? It's a lot harder than you think it is. Oh, yeah. I was hoping for a first in drop go. <laughs> oh. It's not second it? kick and start then. Huh? <laughs> Humpty starts easier than this. Yes, but how Humpty's a much smaller engine. Yeah. And you wanna hand start your engine? Yeah. Well it's got four cylinders, it will start easier. 
Will it? Yeah, probably. I was going to say, there's more engines to move, so it's harder, isn't it? Yeah. Bigger engine. Mine spins over a lot easier than this does. <sighs> right. I'm surprised at him. How little the decompressors do anything. I was expecting. I have just, I have just turned the uh, high compression just slightly, just to help me make it a bit easier. I want to get the pain and anguish on your face as you're doing it. Jesus. I understand why it's called courage. You need courage to start the poxy thing. Is it normally this much effort? Yes. But I think it's kind of good on this down test. Well, they, they weren't going to tell you until you got here, so. <laughs> They're going to, so they haven't done this. <laughs> oh no, I've started it twice. Twice? Seven years you've been here. Seven years. Yes, seven years. Yeah. Twice in seven years. Yes. So who usually starts it? Then we push it and bump it with another yeah, engine. Oh. So, uh, Let's just do that. That sounds a lot easier. Not as fun though. <gasps> fun? I'm dying. Oh, you're so dramatic. Not dramatic. I'm too old for this. It's a young man's game, this is like your game, Morgan. Right. Let's give it a go. This is the biggest workout I've had in years. Right, let's try that again. Ready? Yeah. Bump start sounds like a really good idea about now. Yeah. Anybody else want to go? Oh. We are. We admit defeat at this point. No review today. That's it. That's it. That's just. There's a reason that uh, we moved on to electronic ignition on things. This, this, this is the reason. It's not even a cold day. And you can imagine the struggle you'd have with a hand start engine on the cold day. Oh yeah, it'll fire straight up. They went. Yeah, don't worry about it. They went. I understand why they've only done it twice in the seven years. It's, it's not a warm day, it's like six or seven degrees out. Well, it's still not cold for a diesel. Yeah, imagine if you can't start one in freezing conditions, how hard it is to get a diesel started. Like, well, back then men were men, weren't they? Men were men. <laughs> and finally, all of my hard work paid off. A 
as I was able to take out Sweet Pea for a test run. So what the guys have just told me is this is going to be the first train that this has worked on its own this century. So there's no pressure there whatsoever. And from understanding how this thing works, it's actually a weird thing to drive, but we'll get onto that. So with that, first of all, we use the horn, which is brilliant. And now we just need to be a bit, so I've got the reverser here, but I need to make sure it stays in gear. So I have to reach that. Then the next thing is to lean forward over the throttle, like so, and then I can use both hands to slowly throw the gear lever over, which is horrible. And then I can reach across for the brake, release the brake, and slowly drop the clutch. And that's basically how we get this thing into motion, which is just so very strange. It all makes noise, everything rattles, and there's no glass or anything, so we're just here to get all of the, all the elements. It's quite wonderful, the noise is superb. We are sat on top of the engine with nothing there to get in the way at all. It's, it's very wonderful. Also, in first gear, full throttle is slow. I, the speed in the yard here is five miles an hour and we're not going to get anywhere close. So we're coming up to the first crossing on the line. I love this horn. This horn is amazing. So as we cross out this, we're going to open up the throttle fully and we're going to try and get it into second gear, which will be interesting. So again, lean over the throttle, drop it back slightly, two handles onto the, the gears slowly, and and now give it some throttle that was actually quite good and now comes the best bit as we trundle into the tunnel oh yeah neutral and wind on the handbrake and for something that's only got a handbrake that actually stops surprisingly well that's quite good right so with that we're going to try and go again so it's without doubt the best thing again keeping it in gear leaning forward over the throttle into first gear Gently drop it in as we release the handbrake. Now, admittedly, that's not my best ever start, but we are moving, and that's quite good. So the next plan is to try and get it into second gear ready, because the whole line is uphill, and we want, well, we want to be going. There we are. That's basically with the top speed. Drop the throttle back. Out of gear. All the way. Oh, and gently feed it in. Oh, only just. That was not a good gear change, ladies and gentlemen, but it is slowly picking up speed, which is good because 
as we go up the line, we go around the next corner, then it will um, it will slow down. So we basically want it to give it everything it's got here to give it half a chance. Now, as visibility goes on this thing, it's pretty incredible. There is nothing in the way. The bonnet is tiny. I can see down to my wheels there so I can see whether or not we're actually, well, slipping or anything. The suspension on the right, it's very noisy. The transmission winds, the engine huts, you can hear each cylinder strike. It's amazing. But the actual ride, I was expecting this to clatter all over the place, but it's great. It rides over the line. I mean, that could well be Middleton's track. But actual fact, it's, it's pretty good. And obviously, it's a mechanical thing with a two-speed gearbox, and that drives both axles. They're both chain-driven, so we are actually at the moment being able to put all of the mighty power in that 22 horsepower engine down. And right now, we are flying along. This thing is rapid. Now, with my own 48, when I drive that at full speed, that does feel like you're moving quickly. This feels slow. This feels very slow. And as we start going up here, you can hear the engine start to label, even with a 12 ton weight band behind it. It's quite good. It's really quite good.
like this, something that's so small, so light, still actually be able to be used. And they do shop with this at the railway. They, they quite enjoy firing up and taking it to use it. It's actually, that's quite wonderful because, let's be honest, a thing like this to actually hold use, it's limited in what you can do with it. But it works very well as a small railway someday. If you need to move a wagon around, Though, that really shouldn't have survived. It's small, it's kind of silly. It's not an engine that you would imagine should survive. And yet here it is. And there's something really, really wonderful about something that's silly, something that's quirky. Uh, your big named engines, Klein Scotsman, Bahamas, Allard, they're all engines you understand why they're here because they're hugely significant, they're household names. Sweet pig. This is something that really shouldn't have survived. We've got a crossing coming up. That may be the best thing about the whole locomotive is the horn. I'll be honest, it's fantastic. It's amazing as well. We're in the centre of Leeds and we're ploughing up here. And it's through a park, through the trees. It doesn't feel like we're minutes from the city centre. It's quite special. It's very, very pretty in fact. And it's something really special about driving a locomotive that was built just down the road, basically still on its own turf. That's, that's fantastic. Absolutely, outstandingly fantastic. I'll be honest as well, this cab Although it does nothing for the weather, it's quite nice. I can lean on it. Yeah, that feels. Yeah, the bar here is good. It's terribly ergonomically designed. Having to do four things at once to keep it in gear, to hold the throttle, to use the, the active gears as well as the reverser. It's, it's a very weird machine. And whilst the principle isn't difficult, the actual application make it possibly the hardest thing I've ever tried to drive. But it certainly remains one of the single most fun things I've ever had to go on. It's, it's so silly and so absolutely brilliant. It genuinely is one of my bucket list locomotives to have to go on and it has not disappointed. 100% I would have this. This is fantastic. You could take this with you on go places, relatively easy transportable just like my own and just magnificent fun. Absolutely magnificent. all the way into neutral and apply the brake. What a daft little thing. What a fantastic little thing. So um, the bean can is now full. So it's a uh, pour it back into the tank. Oh, that came out. No problem, sir. And pass it back to young Christian. And so here we are at the other end of the line here at Park Holt and beyond it over there used to be where the coal mines were. Today well it's just it's a country park and it's rather nice and that kind of marks the end of this trip on this railway and all that remains now is to go back down the gradient and what an absolutely magnificent piece of kit this is. One of initially the more complicated locomotives to drive it it's not difficult, it's just awkward. It comes from that age where before ergonomics were really a thing and you basically need eight arms or another driver to actually drive the thing. It's a lot of leaning over stuff. But as an experience, it's magnificent. And also to have the honor of driving it on its first train this century on its own, I'm pretty chuffed about that. I really am very chuffed. It's superb, I've loved it. I, I still don't really understand what its point is. It's just, it's a novelty piece. It's a quirky locomotive, but. I have absolutely loved it. 
And at this point, I must say an absolutely massive thank you to the Middleton Railway for inviting me along and letting me have free range with Sweet Pea. It's been absolutely fantastic. And if you like what you've seen in the video and you want to find out more about the railway, including the locomotives they've got here, then in the video description, there is a link to their website. That's well worth checking out. And if you really like what you've seen, then there's also a link to the volunteer form. If you want to get involved, if you want to learn how to drive Sweet Pea or any of the other engines you've seen in this video. Also, you can try talking to them on Facebook. They're very friendly. Drop them a line, think about getting involved. It's, it's a really nice little society and everybody here is super, super friendly. Also, if you want to go that extra way and just help them out and help say thank you for this, they're currently running their Safeguard the Future campaign to try and support them during these difficult and turbulent times. So there's a link for that in the video description as well. If you wanted to help me out and say thank you to the railway, then help them out financially and uh, help make sure that things like this continue to survive. So. Thank you very much for watching guys. I really hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you think about this. Do you know of a mightier locomotive? And of course, if you haven't already, how about subscribing and give us a like, because it's been quite brilliant. And if you have enjoyed this video, how about clicking over there for another one of our standard gauge inventions when we look at something similar, my own Ruston 48, or how about down there for the biggest locomotive that we so far featured on, Lorry Ghost Loco. We'll see you later guys. I'll get into reverse. Thank you very much. Dog that.